Welcome to WBUR City Space. Thank you for coming out in the Nor'easter. I don't think it's sticking around, but we have colleagues out west. Oh boy, <laughs> they're getting a little bit of snow. My name's Stephen Davey. I'm the senior producer here at WBUR City Space. And happy Pi Day, everyone. Huh? In more ways than one. I tell you what, when um, my wife was telling me about uh, Lauren Coe's work, and we thought, this is amazing. This is so exciting. We should have her on Pi Day. So it, all the gods aligned. The weather didn't cooperate, but you guys are here, and I appreciate it. I appreciate our audiences coming in virtually. Um, a little bit of history. Um, maybe you guys are familiar with apple pie. That was my experience growing up. Maybe a little rhubarb in the summer, a little ice cream on top. It was just plowing into the face. Uh, but our guest tonight has taken the humble pie and tart and turned it into an art. A magical feast of the eyes. Lauren Coe's Instagram and New York Times bestselling book, Pieometry, which you should pick up, shows that pie can be way more interesting with brilliant colors and geometric designs. And our partners at Brookline Booksmith, thank you for coming out, um, have copies of Pieometry available, and Lauren's going to be signing after this discussion tonight. Also, a special thanks to Boston University Food and Wine Program, who have prepared a sweet bite to eat from Pieometry. And, um, the picture and the pie, identical. It's amazing. You guys are in for a real treat. Uh, now, helping us uh, in our deep dive into all things pie is none other on Pie Day is none other than uh, here and now co-host Scott Tong. Please help me welcome Scott and Lauren Co. Good evening, everyone, and glad you came out despite all of this. Uh, <laughs> and you may know we have a tasty treat at the end. So if it gets boring, just remember that. Um, I'm so glad to be here with you, Lauren. We had an interview earlier on. Mm -hmm. uh, let me put this over here. Earlier on in the studio. And we're going to have a, a piece that's going to run on our show here and now. Um, but your story is a remarkable one. We're going to see a lot of photos of your product, of your pies. But you did not start out as a professionally trained chef. <laughs> not at all. I read in close. your book, it's at the start of the book, it's the year 2016. You're living in Seattle. I you're, just a moved there. you're a social mm -hmm. worker, which naturally transitions you to pie. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> Logical. How did that start to happen? How did the light bulb go on? You're like, I think I'm going to try pie. Because you were telling me, kind of like my Asian family, you didn't grow up with pie. <laughs> I did not. Yeah. Um, honestly, a lot of this journey was kind of an accident. Um, again, my professional background was in social work and nonprofit administration. Um, and I moved to Seattle from Boston, actually, in 2016. Um, and was, you told me you complained about the weather here. Yeah, I couldn't handle it. <laughs> and I've brought it back. So yeah. I take full responsibility <laughs> for this storm. Um, but yeah, so I had freshly moved to Seattle, was fun employed, and just kind of dinking around on the internet, as one does, and stumbled across some really beautiful pictures of pie. And that made me think, oh, I've kind of grown up cooking and baking. I come from a family of phenomenal eaters. <laughs> um, but in my Chinese, Honduran, American family, not a lot of traditional apple pie happening. So. Um, basically, I Googled a recipe and went for it. Do you remember it. what it was, the first one? Uh, I think it was just a basic um, apple pie. So I made like a little plaid lattice design on top, and I was really proud of myself. And <laughs> it was fine. Didn't change my life. I didn't instantly transform into a pie lady. It was just kind of something that I added to my repertoire of things that I would bake for fun on the weekends or weeknights. Um, and eventually got a regular office job working in higher ed and um, fast. But then the transformation, it was actually a moment, kind right? Kind of, where, yeah. Where, where you're, you're baking, you're putting your products on Instagram, and then your account on Instagram explodes. What happened? Yeah, well, I, so in 2017, I started this Loco Kitchen Instagram account, and that was a total fluke. I just felt like... That's L-O-K-O... Kitchen, yes. Right, that's Lauren how I introduce yeah. yourself to me. My name is Lauren Coe, and I'm at Loco, <laughs> at Loco Kitchen. So. That's what you do now. You share your yeah, handle? Yeah, yeah. This is where you can find me? 
Yeah. Um, but yeah, I started this Instagram account solely as a personal photo album. I just felt like I was becoming that friend <laughs> and putting too many food photos in my personal account and just wanted kind of a separate holding place for things that I was cooking and baking. Um, it was going to be, you know, summer salads, chocolate chip cookies, blueberry muffins. But it just so happened that the first photo I shared was a geometric peach pie with a really cheesy, like, dad joke pun caption. Um, and I have to say, the book, <laughs> I hope you enjoy puns. It's, it's too full, bad if you it's, don't, because it's, it's full funny. of them. <laughs> it's great, uh, yeah, at least for me. So, sorry, yeah. So, um, so you post this, uh, this one particular post. Yeah, so I share this first photo. Um, you know, I don't have any followers really, but this photo gets several hundred likes, which as a regular person totally blew my mind. Um, and I just kind of was like, oh, what, what, what's happening? Should I put this back on private? Like, who are these people? Are these trolls? Are these bots? Um, so I let it simmer for a little bit and then um, just kind of every few days started sharing photos of pies and tarts that I had either already made and were in my camera roll or ones that I was baking, you know, along the way. So this is and just like pictures on your phone? Like how did you take them? Oh yeah, this okay. is just on my iPhone. Okay. I still don't really know much about photography. My backdrop, that black background on my Instagram is just a $5 chalkboard from Home Depot. And I was just kind of like putting things by the window and taking photos while there was still sunlight. And, and then I couldn't tell if people were coming for the pies or the puns. So I just <laughs> kind of kept doing both. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, a month in, I shared what has become my signature spoke design. And that's when I hit 1,000 followers, which again, like regular person, this is like, pfft. What's happening? This is crazy. Yeah, and we um, can put up, because we have some great images, we have the first image of the signature spoke pie. This is the, uh, the pre-big version, obviously. Yes. So as we're looking at it, uh, you know, tell us how this became known to the world. Um, yeah, I think at the time, pie was having a little bit of a moment, but a lot of people were doing flowers and leaves, very kind of rustically beautiful. And I didn't see anybody doing any sort of modern design. And I'm always kind of looking to think outside the box, do something that feels original. And also, I felt like I was such a pie novice, I didn't feel confident in my ability to hand cut these like really beautiful curves and like wild shapes. And so I gravitated towards this kind of geometric aesthetic because I can cut straight lines, I can cut triangles out of fruit, and it was kind of the path of least resistance. Um, and this was inspired by those spirograph stencils that um, I, I played with um, as a child, I and remember. also kind of thought. You put your number two pencil in the hole. Exactly, and, and you, you kind of spin yeah, it around, yeah, and it kind yeah. of comes out like the spoke design. Um, and then this one in particular, I knew that it was constructed of straight lines. So I just kind of tried it, and it kind of blasted into the world because mm -hmm. of whatever internet black magic is happening at the time. Um, and now it's on the cover of my book. It's been mm. dubbed the modern lattice. And I actually think it's easier than the traditional lattice. Um, but yeah, it's kind mm. of become emblematic of and there my was, style. And was there one gigantic Instagram account that saw it and reposted it? And that was the <laughs> big, it's like being retweeted by yeah, basically. So two yeah. months in Design Milk, which is an on online design magazine, reshared one of my photos that was kind of in the style of this spoke. Lots of like um, strings and you know curves and vortexes. And I remember waking up one morning and looking at my husband and being like, oh, this account reshared one of my photos. I guess that's what you do on Instagram. <laughs> it's cool. They have a million followers. So like, cool. Um, and then we proceeded to watch my phone just completely blow up. I got like 8,000 followers in a matter of hours. Um, and that was just kind of the shot out of the cannon, like the, the catalyst for going viral. So news agencies started reaching out, all kinds of publications. I was in Vogue magazine, Oprah magazine. Then I got an invite to go bake with Martha Stewart on her show. Mm. Um, and so, you know, things literally blew up. Yeah, um, and yeah. by December, I had 100,000 followers and oh my quit goodness. my job. <laughs> ad, ad, real life ad for Instagram right here. Uh, um, Steven is in the booth back there, and he's uh, talking in my ear. He says we have uh, the cooked version of 
this book, and, and here is the cover nice and juicy. of your book. Oh, it, 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 it's, uh, it's great. And we'll, we'll hold on that, and maybe in a little bit, Stephen, if you want to transition, because we have the next one, the kiwi pie, which we can put up in a little bit. But uh, I guess I want to ask about your, your process for the rest of us for whom pie is still a scary thing. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the essentials of the crust. Okay. Right? What are the essential do's and don'ts that you've learned along the way? Yeah, so my book has both tarts and pies, so we can talk about pie since it's pie day. Okay. Um, for pie, the golden rule is to keep everything cold, and that applies at every step. So when I'm making my pie dough, I like to do all butter for simplicity's sake and because of the flavor. Mm -hmm. um, but when I'm salted, ready to make my dough, salted, unsalted. unsalted. I like to control okay. how much salt I add. Okay. Um, and you know, different brands of salted butter can the salt levels can vary. So I stick okay. with unsalted. Um, and when I'm ready to assemble, I pull the butter straight from the fridge so it's nice and cold. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly, once my dough is rested and I'm ready to roll out dough for pie, pull it straight from the fridge. You don't want things sitting on your counter, getting soft, getting melty, particularly if you're baking in the summer with all the beautiful you know, stone fruit and berries that are in mm -hmm. season. Um, and then once my pie is constructed, it goes back in the fridge or freezer to chill before baking. So you okay. want everything nice and cold. That kind of helps your design and, and set. And uh, ice water too, yeah? Yes, As and that's what I use in my solid. pie dough. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, perfect moment for an audience question, um, which is why do you choose butter instead of lard as the fat in your basic Good pie question. dough recipe? Um, Butter's cheaper and easier to get. I go through <laughs> so much of it, I just buy like large Costco quantities of it. Um, I like the flavor better. And also for a lot of my designs, especially the woven ones that require a little bit more time and handling, I find that the all butter pie dough has a little more durability and kind of holds together better than a really kind of tender dough that's made with lard. So mm. that's why I stick with butter. Um, all is there of those a taste reasons, difference but, as far as you um, know? I think so. I like yeah. butter. It has okay. that classically buttery taste. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, yeah, for flavor and kind of practicality sake and for economy, that's why I go with butter. Okay, so keep the questions coming. If you have questions for Lauren, go to slide.do. I hope I'm saying it right. Well, do, another pun. <laughs> S L I dot D O. Can't escape. And enter cuisine. Uh, for that. So, okay, so um, coming back to the, the crust here, I think this is early on in your book. At a certain point, if you, something goes wrong, at what point do you say, start over? Um, I think if you add way too much liquid and your dough is really sticky, that's when you kind of want to jump ship and start over. But okay. um, I like to remind people, especially in my workshops, there are no baking failures, just learning experiences. So for something like pie dough that's really tactile, I've kind of learned by doing over and over, and now I kind of have a sense for what it f should feel like, what it should look like, mm -hmm. and a lot of that is just from, you know, making mistakes and going too far, and then learning from that, being like, I will add less liquid at a time, or, you know, keeping mm -hmm. things colder, or... You know, what happens if things are not kept cold? How does it turn out? Um, your butter just gets a little melty. Your dough can get really soft, and that can lead to a really tough crust when you bake it. Okay. Um, and also, if your pie is super warm when you bake it, your design that you worked so hard to construct can kind of melt and not be oh. as quite as sharp when you subject it to the high heat in the oven. And you also say... Don't over knead the dough. Yeah, it's not like bread dough, so you don't want to be, you know, taking out all your stress and anxiety on this dough. It's just kind of <laughs> gently bringing it together until it just holds. Yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of what gives pie dough its uh, intimidating reputation is that people are really scared about like, oh, how do I know when it's ready? But um, just a gentle hand. You want to okay. be confident, but gentle. Yeah, great. Uh, maybe we'll ask Stephen to, to put a, a next picture out. We have the kiwi uh, pie photo, if we haven't shown that already. We also have, oh, look at that. And so <laughs> geometry, today's pie day. First of all, are you some kind of math geek? 
I get that question a lot. Are you an engineer, architect? Yeah. Um, I have no math background. In fact, math is probably my greatest weakness. I have many memories <laughs> of crying at the dining table with my dad, trying to do my math homework, and just being absolutely miserable. So it's a, a big irony that I kind of do something so math adjacent. So um, <laughs> if you feel intimidated by math also, just know that there is no math involved in um, kind of constructing these pies and the start art. So as we look at this, maybe this is this an illustration of just some of your decorating principles that you can talk us through a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I'm always drawn to clean lines, precision. I think maybe that's like a personality quirk or a little bit of like neuroticism. I like things to be in <laughs> order. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of my designs look more complicated than they are to execute. So this is you're slicing up the kiwi and then I just take a round cutter and punch out circles and then I just cut them in half and I'm lining them up. So here I have golden kiwis and green kiwis so you get to play off mm. the color contrast which brings a little bit of added interest without you know, an extra level of skill or technique. Um, and then usually for a design like this, I'll just rest a ruler straight across the pie, not because I'm measuring anything or I'm calculating anything. It's just I'm using that as like a straight, straight line edge. guide okay. to rest the fruit. And then yeah. I'll work my way top to bottom until it's covered. Pretty simple. Wow. And uh, do you have a lot of colored pie crusts? You have a section on that of coloring. Yeah, yeah. so I'm yeah, always thinking about color, flavor, and texture, and all the ways I can extract the most out of all three things that on, on any given pie or tart. Um, and so part of that is adding color to my pie dough. And I, work, I try to work with only natural ingredients. So that's adding um, freeze-dried vegetable powders or fruit powders. And then instead of the ice water, I'm subbing one-to-one -one with vegetable juice or fruit juice. So beet juice is really great because it gives a really vibrant color mm -hmm. that holds when it's baked. Um, spinach powder and spinach juice, blueberry powder and blueberry juice. Um, and it's you know pretty simple to construct those doughs as well because it follows the same formula as my regular all butter pie dough. Yeah, which brings us to this next audience question. What was the inspiration for adding colors to the pie dough, i.e. beets, which I had never seen before? Yeah, I mean, again, I'm always interested in add, like doing something different, thinking outside the box. Um, and always drawn to color. So, you know, pie dough's tan, it gets kind of monotonous <laughs> and um, adding color kind of helps bring interest and you can, you know, weave it into different patterns. And so um, that was just something that I was interested in exploring and wanted to keep it kind of natural using things that I had. I probably had some powders on hand, some juices on hand or, you know, probably vegetables that I was ignoring in my crisp dra crisper drawer. Um, <laughs> so juice those and tried to add them and see what would happen. Um, so, yeah, and then yeah. I think the bee, it, it gives such a strong, rich, vibrant color. It's a yeah. really great ingredient to use. Great colors holds. just in general. Uh, Yes, actually, uh, there's, th well, yeah, if we can look at the triangle one for, um, for a second, and then I want to uh, spend some time on the next one, but the triangle one is also beautiful, and as we look at that, how has this book, uh, this, uh, this pie lady status <laughs> you have, how has it changed your life, your daily life? Oh my gosh, it's completely changed my life, so I was just doing the nine to five office grind, I was you know, a little bit miserable because I was good at my job, but it just wasn't super fulfilling. There was no creative outlet. Um, and then this kind of happened to me and um, I had never considered food or art or design as any sort of full-time pursuit. And now I get to operate at an intersection of um, art, design, baking, feeding people I love. I get to do it for a living. and. Um, I've had all these amazing opportunities to, you know, go places and mm -hmm. kind of share what started in my humble home kitchen um, with people and I get to see them try to recreate or successfully recreate these things in both professional kitchens and their home kitchens all over the world, which is really wild. And I also have a book that I, you know, never, it never occurred to me mm. that I would ever write a book, much less a cookbook. So, um, 
yeah, it's pretty wild. Well, you know, when I lived in Boston, I was also working an office job and now I'm back and I get to be in this beautiful space with people who have braved the elements to be here. And that's um, really wild. It's also crazy because my book came out in October 2020, which was peak pandemic. So yeah, didn't yeah. really do a book tour. All my events were virtual. Um, so I think this is the biggest um, in-person event that I've gotten to do. And it really feels like a, a huge privilege. And hello to everybody online as well. <laughs> And you also do a lot of workshops yeah, mm -hmm. uh, in the Seattle area. Tell us about where does that happen, who comes? Yeah, so I am a home baker, self-taught or home-learned, um, you know, have the typical story of watching my mom and my grandma bake growing up. Um, and so I feel strongly that if I can do this, anybody can. And again, a lot of these designs look really intimidating, but they're actually really simple to execute. And so I love teaching these workshops. Um, to kind of share that knowledge and to empower people to be able to bake these things and create these things and have this all similar creative outlet. Um, I primarily do them in Seattle because mm -hmm. there's so much equipment involved, rolling pins, knives, cutting boards, mixing bowls. I just stuff everything into my car and drive over to the event space, which makes it challenging to do mm -hmm. workshops elsewhere. Um, but it's been really fun to kind of share the knowledge beyond um, just having recipes in the book. I'm personally mm -hmm. a visual learner, so it's really fun to watch other people who are similarly brained. Um, and it's, it's really fun for me to walk into a class and hear people say, I've never made a pie, or I'm mm. so intimidated. And they leave the workshop saying like, oh, I, I made this beautiful thing. And I feel confident in being able to replicate this at home. I'm really excited to explore this medium. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really cool to be able to see it um, feel accessible. Audience question, what was your family's first reaction to your Instagram account <laughs> and all that comes with it? Has it changed yeah. over time? Uh, I, I, I have a daughter in college and I'm trying to monitor the Instagram account myself. <laughs> Yeah, I think there wasn't much of a reaction initially because my parents were like, what's social media? What's Instagram? <laughs> like, what are these words that you're saying? <laughs> um, and honestly, like, I was also like, what is happening? What's, you know, what's all this commotion? Um, but I think, it, you know, there was kind of name recognition in like Martha Stewart and Oprah and Vogue. And that's when they started to be like, oh, like, yeah, something's happening. Whatever you're doing at home is like launched <laughs> into the world. And it's kind of cool. And um, yeah, they've been really supportive. Like, ooh, I don't know if this is a good idea. It was all positive. Um, I've been really lucky. They've been really supportive and excited. I think it helps that they weren't really sure what was happening initially. Wow. Um, but now they're really excited. And my parents are really sweet. They, My dad actually has printed a ton of my Instagram pie photos and made a <laughs> pie wall on his dining room. Oh. It's very embarrassing, but really sweet. It's, uh. <laughs> So, you know, for this next question, I'm going to ask Stephen if you can kind of go back to that first uh, pie, kind of pre-oven um, pie, because this goes to something I spoke about in our interview as far as social media. A lot of the pies that you, that you post on social media, Stephen, thank you, yeah, this one, um, are pre-oven, right before mm -hmm. they go in. I guess first of all, why do you why do you do that? And number two, what criticism have you received <laughs> for that? Yeah, so I share both. I have tarts and pies, and usually the tarts that I share, particularly the ones with fresh fruit, those don't get baked, so mm -hmm. that is the finished product. Um, and then I share both baked and lots of unbaked photos of my pies, just because I really like the precision, the sharpness. Um, I also consider myself an artist, over baker, it just so happens that my mm. medium is edible. Um, and of course I want every, you know, the bottom line is flavor, it has to taste good and look good. Um, but I just feel like we can appreciate an art piece at you know, every stage of its development, which includes before it goes into the oven, and then of course when you subject anything to high heat, it's going to transform a little bit, the color will likely fade a bit, um, and we can still appreciate how it looks then. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, ultimately this art is made to be destroyed or eaten, <laughs> um, and I feel like that's another way to kind of consume the art. So. Um, you know, it is the internet. Anything you put out there, people have things to say about it. And initially, uh, 
almost all the comments were like, yeah, but what does it look like baked? Which, if you follow me, we've turned into a hashtag as like a kind of tongue in cheek kind of joke. Um, but I don't know. I, I like being able to share what it looks like beforehand, and we get to mm -hmm. kind of appreciate it in all its crisp, vibrant glory, and then, you know, bake it and, of course, have it, you know, become really flaky or really juicy um, and, you know, appreciate it in a different mm -hmm. way. Well, speaking of baking, um, how many of you, like me, have had something pretty beautiful go into the oven and then it comes out and it doesn't look like itself at, at the end? <laughs> just kind of whoosh. I mean, um, again, flavor is the bottom line. So if it tastes good, that's really all that matters. It has to look reasonable, though. <laughs> uh, I mean, why does that happen? It, where it just kind of caves in on itself? Um, I guess if we can talk specifically about fruit pies, um, sometimes yeah, yeah. if you use in-season fruit, it's really hard to control for how juicy it's going to be. So, you know, things like peaches, cherries, berries, they're definitely going to cook down when you subject mm. them to a prolonged period of high heat. So um, sometimes your, you know, pie crust will sink a little bit and you can, that's, you know, part of your learning baking processes figuring out quantities, maybe you add more fruit or you mix it with a different kind of fruit like apple that kind of holds its structure a little bit okay. better. Okay. Um, but you, you know, sometimes it's hard to the... it's hard to know if it's like peak season like midsummer peach. It's, yeah. it'll taste delicious, but it mm -hmm. will be really juicy. Speaking of fruit, we have this amazing photo that I'm gonna ask Stephen to put up now, the miso pear floral tile. Oh, <laughs> oh. I explain. love this crowd. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, what is going? This is amazing. What is going on here? Yeah. I mean, again, I was. I'm always trying to like think of things that I haven't seen done before on a pie, um, and this was my attempt at incorporating kind of my geometric tendencies while also incorporating color in a different way. So these are all edible flowers that I actually foraged and picked from my neighbor's garden. So she grew these herself mm. um, and just kind of pressed them onto each tile. Um, and it's really fun because once you bake it, they look like press dried flowers and they add a little bit of like crunch and texture. No extra flavor, luckily for all of us. Um, but mm. it's just a really fun way to kind of celebrate, you know, nature and incorporate color in a, in a different way. How do you do the tiles? Um, I have a geometric cutter. So these are not hand cut. Mm. Um, too lazy for that. Um, and basically, I press the flowers in. I roll out the dough, press the flowers in, and then just use a tile a hexagon cutter to okay. punch out these tiles. And then, and then I just lay them, them. On, the, on the pipe surface. Okay. Another good question from the audience. How do you go about finding new flavor combos and inspirations for your creation. Yeah. And earlier on, you talked about, you know, I've worked on one book before, and I felt like I was just kind of depleted mentally. And you, you said <laughs> yeah. the same thing. So I feel that. I you, think I poured everything into yeah, this book. Yeah. How do you keep finding new inspiration? Yeah. So inspiration is everywhere. A lot of what I make stems from things I enjoy eating, combinations that I think are interesting. Um, I'm also a big proponent of using what you have. And so a lot of times what I set out to make is informed by, oh, these mangoes on my counter are getting a little wrinkly, or I happen to have 20 pounds of apples and I need to do something <laughs> with that. Um, and Washington so it's State. just kind you of, live in Washington yeah, State. exactly. Yeah. Um, or what's in season and what's on sale. Cause again, home baker, shopping at a regular grocery store, trying to save money where I can. Um, and so that's kind of how I take inspiration. And then design wise, um, I have pies and tarts in my book and in my Instagram that are inspired by things like patio furniture, public mm. restroom bathroom tile, um, <laughs> bamboo clutches. So way, yeah. really yeah. inspiration can be anywhere. <laughs> and I think especially over the pandemic, I was doing kind of like outdoor walks or walking my dog and doing these things called texture studies where I take super close up shots of, you know, like leaves on the ground or, mm. um, you know, this concrete texture looks really interesting or the way the shadow is hitting over here um, and just kind of using that to um, help me again think outside the box, reimagine how um, I can present things. A lot of it too is, you know, how, how many different ways can I cut this fruit and present mm. it in a, mm -hmm. in a different way. So, 
Uh, this is a great question. Have you applied your artistic design style to other mediums, food or otherwise? I think we talked about this on Zoom before you came out here, whether it's pasta or wallpaper or printed fabric. I mean, these are all just canvases, I guess. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. Again, I, I really love art. It just so happens that my medium is edible here, but um, yeah, over the pandemic, I think my manuscript had wrapped up. I was in the editing phase and just feeling depleted. I felt like I poured everything in. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't have any more ideas. I don't want to be in the kitchen anymore. <laughs> um, and was still kind of itching to have some sort of creative outlet. And I actually painted a couple murals on my backyard fence. Oh, I was like, yeah. oh, let's, let's, I started with like two panels. Um, and then actually really enjoyed it and then kind of kept branching out. And so there's two very different murals and I wish I had kind of set out more intentionally because mm. they don't match and it kind of bothers me. Um, but it was really fun and I hope to have more time to kind of continue and explore in that way. And, and in other kinds of food, uh, the, the, one of the questions suggested pasta. I mean, have you thought about and we're going to talk about tarts and savory in a second, mm -hmm. but do you, how do you think more broadly about applying this? Um, yeah, or, I think beyond? the the method and the technique that I use to color my dough has been done with pasta. I have a friend named Linda. Her Instagram is Salty Seattle. We <laughs> like to joke because she's also in Seattle, so we like to joke that we are each other. But she does what I do, but with pasta, and I do oh. what she does, but with pie dough. Okay. Um, so I don't really venture into the pasta kind uh -huh. of space since she's so good at it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I like things that look nice and taste good. So if I have the like time and the patience and the brain energy, mm -hmm, then, mm -hmm. you know, I like to, you know, plate things nicely and kind of always play with color and flavor. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on and talk about tarts, uh, tart selections. Um, here is the, oh, the salmon tomato. I love this picture. The salmon tomato tart is just. So as we look at this, uh, let's talk about the, the crust for the tart. Is it, in general, easier or harder than a basic pie crust? I think tarts are easier. So if you're looking to get into baking pies or tarts, I would start with the tarts. They're a little simpler. Okay. Um, the dough is not as finicky or delicate. You don't have to worry about, like this recipe in the book, you put it in the food processor and like blitz it. And even if you blitz it too much, it'll still be fine. Um, and for this one specifically, so one of the ironies of this journey is that I don't really have a sweet tooth. And I don't actually <laughs> love eating pie that much. Um, Let's just strike that one from the yeah, record. I'm, you can't say that. <laughs> I'm team savory, so obviously had to include okay. lots of savory recipes in the book as well. Um, and generally, stuff that I make gets pawned off on friends, family, neighbors, basically anybody in the vicinity who's willing to take them or I donate them to fundraise. Willing to take like that. them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the savory ones are the ones that we end up keeping in our house. So okay. this is a good brunch one. There's a potato and cheddar tart that I'm only allowed to make once a year because it'll sit Ooh. on the kitchen counter. And every time we walk by, we'll just like take a little piece. And before we know it, it's completely gone. So. <laughs> Um, those are the ones that mm -hmm. my household has to watch out for. What's in this one? This is called the salmon tomato tart. So Yeah, so what, we've got yeah. an everything bagel inspired crust. So it's got all the like spices oh. in there. Mm -hmm. um, and then the filling has cream cheese, smoked salmon, everything you like on a lox and bagel capers. Um, and then on top are tomatoes, but this tart also works really well with like fresh cucumbers or any kind of fresh vegetables. Um, good for a you know summer day or a brunch or or dinner. So how long does this take? It looks like it takes so long. Again, a lot of them look very complicated, and then once you kind of see a demo or see the process, it's like oh, it's pretty simple. So this is just tomatoes that are sliced, mm -hmm. and then. You know, to bring added interest, I'm using different colored tomatoes. So usually as I'm slicing, I just kind of pile them onto plates by color so that as I'm organizing them, um, they're already sorted. Uh, and then I just kind of 
stagger them in rows and work my way for this one from the outside in, mm. organizing by color. So pretty simple. She's very modest, you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> no, truly, if I can do this, anybody can. I really believe it. Do you ever find yourself, another good question from the audience, do you ever find yourself burned out from, burned out, thank you, from making pie? <laughs> And if so, how do you learn to love it again? Do you need like a break every once in a while? Um, yeah, if anybody has a secret, I would love to hear. I feel a little like, how many years has it been? Five or six, and it's been mm. really fun, but you know, I really struggle to come up with new ideas sometimes. Um, pie can be such a, a lengthy process that it can feel a little bit like work. Um, but again, I just kind of go back to things that I like to eat, Mm -hmm. um, designs that I feel really drawn to, or you know, sometimes I just have to leave the kitchen and paint a mural in the backyard to kind of get myself re-inspired, um, or you know, do some other kind of cooking and baking and give myself a break and then come back to it. Uh, on the savory side, then to tell us, I don't know if we have uh, more photos of this, but tell us about some of your favorites on the savory side that you like to do. Um, yeah, so there is a, one pie that has, I think, like sausage and sun-dried tomatoes and mm. olives. Yeah, and it's similar to the flower pie where I've created oh. these kind of tiles, but instead of flowers, I've pressed, pressed fresh herbs into there or into the dough, and that brings, again, design, color, texture, and flavor. This one has a really lovely aroma when it's baking as well. Mm. So if you need your house to smell good, this one's really fun. Um, it's filled with meat, so it's nice and filling. Um, so what are the herbs? Is that rosemary? There's what chives, there's sage, there's some mm -hmm. thyme. Um, yeah, I see some rosemary in there okay. as well. Mm. Wow, but you do savory more often for yourself? Um, not too often because they are a little bit more work. They usually require more ingredients and a little bit more cooking plus the added like if I want to make it look like this then it's the design on top of the cooking. So oh, I yeah. tend to stick with the fruit pies because they're a little bit simpler. Mm -hmm. um, again I like the design aspect the most so kind of any other shortcuts or time-saving uh, methods I can imp implement in the rest of the process, I'll probably use those. So I tend to stick to sweet pies for the ease of them, mm. but um, I do prefer to eat the savory pies. <laughs> Lauren, you've talked about your, your kitchen at home. Maybe you started out with, I don't know, a standard home kitchen. Do you have like this fancy schmancy kitchen now at home? Um, I'm lucky enough to have a spacious kitchen, Okay. Um, but I like to tell people that you don't need a lot of equipment or a lot of tools, whether they're fancy or extensive, to kind of do what I do. A lot of it is just a sharp chef's knife. Um, people often ask me, you know, what's your favorite brand of rolling pin or, you know, favorite brand of whatever. And honestly, the stuff that I use is just what I had and I've become accustomed to. So the mm. best rolling pin for your pie art is the one that you're most comfortable using. Um, the best knife is one that's sharp and that you're able to handle. Um, so I have a few more tools and probably a lot more pie pans now. Um, <laughs> but I wouldn't say that I have a lot of like fancy equipment or machines or anything because um, my toolkit is really pretty simple. Favorite pie pan or Favorite pie, pie pan, pan size? Yeah, so again, I give away a lot of what I make. Mm. So I actually use the disposable aluminum pans a lot. Okay. And those work really great. I do like to use the ones that have a little bit more structure. Some of them are really flimsy. Um, not that I would know, but it can be really devastating when you go to pick up an unbaked pie and it just kind of folds in on itself. Uh. So I recommend the ones that have a little bit more structure. But if we're doing reusable pie tins, the USA brand with the corrugated bottom is my preferred. Oh, mm -hmm. um, I've never had a soggy bottom. The pie always comes out of the pan. No problem. But um, the glass, the really cheap glass Pyrex ones are great too, and those are especially good for beginners because you can kind of carefully check underneath to see if the bottom is cooked and yeah, yeah. golden all the way through to mm -hmm. kind of gauge how much, or how much longer you have to bake or if it's ready. Question from the audience, were there any complete flavor flops? that you thought were going to be amazing. Yeah, I really wanted to do a pear hibiscus pie in the book. 
and I just could not get it to work. I thought the color was going to be really great. The flavor of the hibiscus was going to be mm -hmm. lovely, but it just kept coming out like really mushy and grainy. And then it just, the color also, like the way the hibiscus mixed with the pear in a baked pie was just kind of sickly. Um, <laughs> so cross that off the list. I spent yeah. weeks testing that one and oh, it, yeah. it didn't make it. And I, I don't <laughs> think I'll ever go back to it. Yeah. Okay, one more. Is smart to sort? your pie elements by color, do you do the same when you put together a jigsaw puzzle? <laughs> um, yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, I don't do a ton of puzzles. It's like you sort out the corners and edges and then group things but by color. But there is an order to um, your Yeah, method, I do seems. tend to organize that way. All my cookbooks are, are organized by color, not by alphabetical order. So um, if it's ever my husband's turn to cook, and he's trying to find a, a particular book. He's like, I can't find it. I'm like, oh, it's in the orange section. Go there. <laughs> so, yeah. Your kitchen, I think for some of us, at least for me, the kitchen is a place, a creative space, you know, after we're in an office environment or looking at I mean, the rest of us have to work. Um, <laughs> this is work, then, too. And then... The kitchen is can be a creative space, not necessarily something new, but just a place to decompress and sometimes try something on a Saturday. You know, a lot of steps doing something new and different is kind of rewarding. Yeah, definitely. Is it still that way for you, this creative place, or or does it? <laughs> it is kind of your office. Um, maybe a little bit of both. I think I definitely started out with this as my creative outlet. It's kind of my opportunity to kind of chill out and just listen to an audiobook or listen to music and just kind of do listen these. Listen yeah, 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 definitely. All the podcasts, <laughs> all the live radio. Um, and then just kind of cut all these meticulous shapes and uh -huh. quietly craft. Um, but now that it's my job, you know, you know, sometimes a job is a job. You have days that it feels like work, and then there are days when I feel really inspired and really excited about what I do, and again, it feels like a really fun, creative exercise. So yeah. I think it's a little bit of both, and that's kind of follows the natural rhythm of life. Mm -hmm. What was hard about the book? Uh, everything. <laughs> it was very overwhelming. Um, I was obviously very new to the food space. I didn't know anything about publishing. I had never thought about writing a, a book. Um, and it was all very accelerated because, you know, I went viral and then all these opportunities started coming mm. up and I Did just a publisher had to come to you? capitalize. Yeah, I was very okay. lucky to have publishers and literary agents reach out to me and I actually like let those emails sit in my inbox for a while because I didn't know what to say. I was like, a book? I would never write a book. That's crazy. Wow. <laughs> um, and, you know, eventually assigned an agent who kind of helped walk me through the process. We developed a proposal, and then I had nine months to develop this entire manuscript, and I had no idea what I was doing. I had mm. no experience in recipe developing, so I had to learn all these skills while I had to execute them in real time. So. Um, I think I just kind of blacked out all of 2019 kind of pushing on this and deadline. just like all yeah. of a sudden we have a book here, but it was definitely long days, um, weekly trips to Costco. Like we would go every Monday <laughs> and just get like a flatbed and load it up with flour, butter, sugar. And wow. even now I'm not used to going to the grocery store and like putting everything in my cart. I'm like, oh, was this even worth a trip? I'm like, no, this is a normal person's quantity of groceries. I don't have to buy 50 pounds of flour every single week. Um, but I think I'm far enough removed that I would consider writing another one. But um, definitely the last few years have been like, I got to take a break. That was a, a really crazy, really fun um, kind of experience. And I'm glad I did it. But uh, yeah, I think all of it was was challenging. I didn't know what to expect, and it was just kind of more than I ever thought it would be. How about be. the photography? Uh, I don't know, Stephen, if we have any we haven't put up yet. Maybe the strawberry rhubarb pinwheel. I don't know if we've seen that one yet. Or, um, who? there it is. Who took your photos? Uh, <laughs> not me, that's for sure. So again, I'm still taking photos on my iPhone. Um, we hired a photographer named Ed Anderson, and he was actually based in California. So we had to fly him out two separate weeks, and we baked all 50 pies in those two weeks. So oh. um, yeah, wow. and also I live in Seattle where most houses don't have AC. 
um, because it didn't used to be that hot pre-climate change and global warming. Um, and so we were going to shoot a week in May and a week in June, and I just thought, there's no way I can have my oven on for a week straight and have it be summer and like 90 degrees and ah. also be working with pie dough while we have to photograph. So we actually had to get AC installed in the house where we photographed everything. We cleared all the furniture. <laughs> all of these pies were taken on the floor of my living room, actually. <laughs> um, there are photos of just, you know, the tripod and me just like hunched over. If oh. I have back problems later in life, we'll blame this book. Um, but yeah, it, uh, he came and the first week we tried to front load as many pies and tarts as we could. So I had spreadsheets and like things scheduled out by the minute. Like while we photograph this one, this one's going to be in the oven and this one will be, oh my you know, chilling. And then we'll put that one in the oven. We'll put this one on the photo backdrop. So it was kind of go, go, go that first week. And then the second week we just photographed. Um, the rest of the pies and all the other stuff like, you know, dough and, you know, had more fun with like throwing powder everywhere and, you know, cutting <laughs> So you are an engineer. Stuff, so. I think you are. <laughs> I mean, with your spreadsheets. Um, <laughs> I guess so. Audience question. You said you did not eat pie when you were growing up. What kinds of desserts did you have and do they inspire your pies now? Yeah, definitely. So I had a lot of flan. Tres leches, um, a lot of Latin desserts. So my mom was born and raised in Honduras, and my grandma actually still lives there. So those were kind of that's kind of where my um, palate runs. Those mm. sort of flavors. Um, we had a lot of um, barbecues where we'd cook carne asada and grill uh, pineapple, and we'd always sprinkle a little bit of cinnamon on the pineapple mm. and get that really lovely sweet char. And there's a a uh, pie in my book that is inspired by that. So it has grilled cinnamon pineapple oh, stuffed mm. in between like really buttery flaky dough. Um, and so, you know, a lot of what I make or what you see in the book stems from things that I grew up eating, things that I really enjoy eating and, um, you know, desserts yeah. like that. Was your baking originally inspired by any bakers in particular, any cookbooks in particular? Yeah, so at the beginning when my Instagram first went viral, there were some like pie ladies that had been doing pie, but again, like lots of flowers, lots of leaves, lots of letter cutouts. Um, and so we kind of became good friends where we, you know, operated with the same medium, but had very mm -hmm. different styles. And it was fun to kind of bounce ideas off each other. But when I was working on my book, I tried not to read any pie books. I tried not to look at um, a lot of the pies that were out there because I wanted to create something that was yeah. felt really original and, you know, value add. There's a million pie or yeah, there's a lot of pie books, but there's a million cookbooks out there. And I wanted to make sure that mine felt really original and different and felt like I was kind of adding something to the landscape. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Should we do a little show and tell now? We have about 10 more minutes or sure. so. Sure. And we have the camera there. So let's move over there All right. where do you're going demo. to show us the spoke design. Is that right? <laughs> yes, the signature spoke. The signature spoke. Uh, and now you can I'll really believe me when I say that it's easier than it looks. And you will be able to leave and do this yourself in your home. If you haven't already, I'm guessing there are many pie bakers in this crowd. So, Who's a pie baker? Oh, my people. <laughs> not everybody, though. Not everyone. Who has never baked a pie? Anybody? Oh, look at that. That's fair enough. And you know, I like to say that my book is for professional bakers, home bakers, and also armchair bakers. So if you like to look at pretty photos or give it to somebody else who will bake for you, you know, has a wide range of um, users. So I think we're just waiting for okay. this dough just and this make pie. Sure this Thank you so much. Audio still works. I'll move my mic a little bit. Perfect. And OK, so what do we? Thank you. Um, and a big thank you to BU Food and Wine, who have prepped all these things for me. Yes, tell us um, where you were earlier today, because that's part of the story. Yeah, here, yeah, so I was with BU Food and Wine, particularly with their, there's a professional certificate program of pastry arts. Um, and their students actually are the ones who have made the happy as a gram tart that you'll get to sample tonight. 
Um, and I got to do this demo, show them how I make my all butter pie dough, um, and spend a little bit of time with them today. So I'm really grateful for all of their support and their work. And normally when I fly in for events like this, I have to fly in like two to three days in advance and I'm just like sweating in a kitchen that I'm <laughs> unfamiliar with doing all the prep. And here, I just kind of got to be in the kitchen and do all the fun stuff and they've you know, prepped and done all the, the nice. hard work. So a big thank you to them. Okay. All so right, so away. again, golden rule is to keep everything nice and cold. This is super cold. It's been sitting in the fridge. Um, we are just going to focus on the design part. So um, this dough so has this been rolled not, out. Nothing's been baked yet here. Nothing's yet. been baked okay. yet. So we have pie dough in the pie shell. We've got a lovely blueberry rhubarb filling or a blueberry. Um, and then we've got our top crust rolled out. I always put my top crust on parchment so that if the okay. dough starts to get warm, you can slide a baking sheet right under it, put it back in the fridge, chill it down, and you don't run the risk of this dough being on your work surface and then just like melting to your counter and okay. running into a and melty disaster. And I can still disaster. see the butter in there. I mean, exactly, and that's what you want. Yes, mixed. you want all those butter chunks okay. and streaks, and that's what's going to bake up into those really lovely flaky okay. layers. So. For this design, we are going to cut this whole surface into strips. And again, contrary to popular belief, I'm not sitting here like measuring each strip and kind of sketching out. I just wing it and eyeball it because, again, kind of lazy sometimes. So first, I'm going to trim off these little scraggly bits. I'll just leave that there. Um, and then for this design, it'll be about a quarter <laughs> inch thick of a strip. Um, and I'm right-handed, so I like to go right to left and then top okay. to bottom. Um, and again, earlier I talked about making what you have work for you. So when I first moved to Seattle and I made that first pie, I didn't even have a ruler in my tiny apartment, um, didn't even know that a tool like this existed. So I used a cookie sheet and a knife to cut these dough strips. So um, again, you don't need fancy equipment. You don't need anything expensive to make this happen. Um, look around your kitchen, you'll be surprised how many tools are at your disposal, whether they're specifically for that purpose or otherwise. All right, so I am just going to make my way across the surface of the pie, slice this into strips. Because when you assemble, I mean, it, it looks like it's this circle spoke, but I guess that's the optical illusion of it. Yes. You're actually just placing straight strips in that pattern. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. Kind of looks like a spiral vortex, and sometimes I see photos of people trying it at home, and the tendency is to want to curve it around that center ring cutter that we'll place in the center of the pie. Um, but this design is actually even simpler, where you keep the strips nice and straight, and you just lay them on the pie, and then you move on. So I actually think it's easier than the traditional lattice, because you don't have to worry about folding certain strips back and following a pattern or anything. Mm -hmm. um, in a second, we'll see that once you put the dough in the pie, you just leave it there and you don't have to touch it again. How long can you, how long can dough last, say, in the fridge? Um, in the fridge, I would say a couple days. If okay. you know you're not going to use it, I would just pop it in the freezer. So usually I make a big batch of dough, let it rest in the fridge until you know all the gluten is formed. Oop, it's a little bit steep. Which is a few hours overnight? Yeah, a minimum of three hours. I like okay. to do it overnight just so okay. it's um, nice and rested. And then I will usually stick it all in the freezer so that when I am ready to roll it out, then I just pull it out, let it thaw in the fridge overnight, and okay. then I just kind of have an endless store of dough and ready to go. And you can freeze it for long like time three to six months okay it hasn't i've never had the uh occasion to leave it in there longer i usually use yeah, it yeah. fast okay. enough okay um yeah. but i think it lasts pretty long okay here we go all right so i think i was told to move the strips this way oh, and the okay. pie this, this way so everybody working, can see Stephen? is that is a that good angle good? <laughs> yeah okay he says good um, and a quick note about dough scraps. You can bake these off and have them as working snacks because, you know, your pie is going to be <laughs> chilling in the fridge and you then it'll bake for a do. couple hours. You need something to do. You can also bake off these strips as pie fries e with either cinnamon sugar or team savories. Uh, sprinkle them with Parmesan cheese. Oh. So 
Um, okay, no so worries. first yeah. step is, or a second step, this was the first step. Mm -hmm. We're gonna take a little ring cutter. If you don't have a circle cutter, you can use a little cup or a little bowl, and we'll just rest it right in the center, gently. And then we'll start by just picking up one strip and laying it across the surface. This one's a little tiny bit short. That's okay. And then we'll just press it into the edge. And okay. that's the entire technique. <laughs> so I know, very complicated. You definitely have to go to culinary school to do this. Uh, Not yeah. at all. <laughs> um, if you can pick up a dough strip, and then basically this is where it sounds technical, but the end in your left hand will be to the left of the first strip, and okay. the end in your right hand will be to the right. Oh, you, see, you keep yeah. going. All right. Yeah, so we're just going to keep moving in the same direction all the way around the pie. Again, okay. keeping the strip straight, press it into the edge, and, and then it should it also, down. yeah, just, just to make it sure down. it stays, not too okay. hard. Um, and then you also want to make sure the strip grazes that kind of center ring cutter, and this is our reference point. Okay. So, again, the strips are separated by about half inch gap. And you want to make sure the space is even on both sides. That will kind of lend the, the, yeah, yeah. the visual precision. Okay. And um, that's pretty much it. We'll make our way all the way around the pie twice. So right now you can see there's a single layer of dough. Um, and you'll know when to stop when it's doubled up all the way around. Or okay. if you run out of strips. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And this is, so. uh, for this amount of dough, this is a standard dough recipe quantity, yep. you're not using extra to nope. get these strips. Yep, this yeah. is one okay. disc of dough. Okay, and this is yep. in the oven for how long? Um, it depends on what your filling is. So for something like really juicy, like berries, it'll take a little bit longer, but I like to initially blast the pie at high heat. So I'll do 30 minutes at like 425 or 400, um, and then I'll cover the edge, mm -hmm. um, and then I'll turn the heat down to either 375 or 400, and then keep baking it until, one, the crust is golden, but mm -hmm. most importantly, that the filling is bubbling all the way through the center. So that's when you know it's fully cooked because- All the way through the um, center, okay. Yeah, we use, okay. I use tapioca starch as a thickening agent, and so you want it to be boiling and bubbling so that cooks out and you don't have that kind of grainy, floury texture when you eat the pie. Okay. Well, we'll have more and maybe you'll have time to do this as we talk to our audience, who I want to thank now and join me in thanking Lauren Coe before we have a little snack. Thank you so much for coming. Very fun. Should I keep finishing this or? Sure, yeah. I know Stephen has a We're quick word there. before we move along, so. That looks keep amazing. Going. I'll just keep goodness. going. I have like two more minutes sure. to, <laughs> till this is done, so. Thank you all for coming out. Keep watching. Um, congratulations to Emily Donahue. <laughs> I believe you said you hadn't baked a pie before. Well, now you have an umbrella to think about it on your way home. <laughs> you will need it. <laughs> thank you to Scott and thank you to Lauren. What amazing work you're doing. It's so fun. And uh, thank you all for coming out. Um, also, thank you to Brookline Booksmith. Lauren will be signing copies of Pyometry out in the lobby. Be sure to stop by. And thank you to Boston University Food and Wine Program, yes. um, who have prepared the Sweet Bites for you to eat to try from Lauren's book. Um, coming up next here at City Space, just a quick plug. Uh, join us for our next curated cuisine in partnership with Radio Boston. We're calling it Brewed in Mass. And take a guess what we're going to do. <laughs> Deep dive into all things craft beer here in the Bay State, and we'll have beer tasting with six breweries in the lobby. You don't want to miss it. Find tickets at wbur.org slash events. Thank you all. Great. Thanks, Stick around. Thank you. Right? Stick around. Yes. Okay. And, and then, there we go. And, and just your last step was what? Just now? Uh, just you gently just cut around. removing. Oh, yeah. I trimmed off all the excess. So you you can either roll down, it in as a crimped trim edge around. or just trim. Yeah, yeah. And then remove your center cutter, and there you go. Great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> and then, yeah. Great. Well, I guess if you have any questions before we move on, Come on up and ask him directly to her.